What's up, Chris? Andrew, good morning, Serge. God bless you. What's up, Steve? Good morning, brother. All right, Carlton, God bless you. Serge, again, good morning. Testing one, two, three. Manny, God bless you, Manny. Good to see you. It's been warm out there? All right. Mosquitoes flying around. Mosquitoes or skeeters? Both. It better be. It better be. <laughs> Good morning, John. God bless you. Man, there's there's all kinds of mosquitoes flying around here this morning. All right, you guys, we're going to get started this morning. I want to say good morning to everybody. Good morning to those who are watching this online. Uh, you know what? Today, Lonnie made breakfast. Yay. <laughs> so we know it's going to be manna from heaven. Uh, today, uh, after, did, were any of you guys here who went to the steak and study? Yeah, we had a good time. You know, where else can you get for 10 bucks? I mean, if you think about going to Fleming's, how much would a steak cost at Fleming's? 70 bucks? That's just for the steak, right? Or if you go to uh, Joey's Barbecue, I don't know if you get steak at Joey's or uh, what's the other one, Lucille's? You know, just a six ounce is how much? Right? Porter Steak, uh, what's that place in Long Beach? Steak, what's the steakhouse called? It's a lighthouse. Parker's Lighthouse. 60 bucks a steak. We had steak and one pollo uh, potato, potato salad. And we had ice cream. And we had a soft drink. Ooh, 10 bucks, right? So guess what? We're going to have another one. And so Andy will be here after service uh, selling tickets. 
And again, you guys, it's as our conference, our men's gathering is coming, our theme is Vessels for Honor. And this last time we looked at the man that God uses, and we're going to continue that. But we're going to start talk about the fleeing of youthful lusts and the quarrels that start among us. And how does God use this for God to be uh, a man that God uses? So we'll take a look at that. Uh, also, it won't be sold today, but if you go to the gazebo after service tomorrow and Sunday, we have tickets for our couples conference, a threefold cord. That's going to be August 20th and August 21st. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to bring my wife because she really needs it. Uh, and so, that's going to be one of those things. I hope you're listening, honey. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be going on August. Uh, that's going to start August 20th. She's not watching, so I'm good. <laughs> If she was watching, I'd say, oh, honey, we need this. You know, I can learn from this. She's, <laughs> don't give her an idea. <laughs> so I hope she does get a lot out of it. Uh, but men, it's, it's a great way to bring your wife. It's going to be August 20th at 7 p.m. here. Uh, we have Jason and Christy Duff. Uh, we have Larry Powers that will be speaking. And then Saturday, uh, it's going to be Jeff, 8th. Nine o'clock? Uh, May 30th. May 8.30. 8 30. And so get your tickets. You know, it's, uh, it's investing in your, into your marriage. And then uh, as we pray this morning, we want to continue to pray for Bill Arianis. Uh, he's home now. He's getting better. Uh, but we want to keep him in prayer. And then Jeff Hatfield's grandpa, or I call him grandpa because we look very similar. Uh, you can tell that we're related when you see him. Uh, his name's Lee. And he has two broken vertebrae. He fell. And so you know the pain for that. Uh, so let's lift him up in prayer. And then continue to lift Joe Vasquez up. His, as we know that he recently lost his father. So uh, let's continue to pray for our brothers. And, and we know that God is the God who heals. God is the God who is faithful. So let's pray you guys. And then we'll get into our study. Father we thank you so much for your mercy and your grace. Lord we thank you for your healing. Lord, we thank you for your sovereignty and your peace. And Lord, this morning, as we lift his request up to you, Lord, we lift up Bill Arianis before you, Lord. We lift up Lee Dacus before you. We lift up Joe Vasquez and his entire family, Lord, as they're going through this difficult time of loss. So Lord, may your peace be upon each of these that we've named. And Lord, we know that there's even some here this morning that have unspoken requests. I was speaking with my brother earlier before our service started here this morning, and he's asking for prayer for his wife, uh, for healing, Lord. And so, Lord, these petitions we bring before you. And, Lord, now as we open your word, may your name be glorified and honored. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, you guys, afterwards, it's going to be an amazing breakfast. Uh, again, Lonnie broke it. Now, if you're Dodger fans, be careful of what you eat, because Lonnie is a Giants fan, and who knows? Yes. Oh. Oh. Handle these guys, please. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> First Kings chapter 12. And we're going to start at verse 6 and we're going to read to 11 and we're going to have just a brief recap. So let's start with 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he lived and said, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him saying, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young man who had grown up with him, who stood before him, and he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father has put upon us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, this, you should speak to this people who has spoken to you, saying, your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus shall you say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. 
My father chase, uh, chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. Some versions say with scorpions. And so a brief recap, what, we, what has been going on so far is that Solomon is now dead. And we know that Solomon, when he died, his heart had turned away from the Lord. And as a result of his disobedience, the kingdom is now being ripped to piece and divided. We saw a scene in chapter 11 where uh, Rehoboam, Jeroboam, who was an officer and in the royal court of Solomon, had fled to Egypt because Solomon sought to kill him. And now that Solomon is dead, Jeroboam hears of this and he's being summoned by the assembly of Israel. He wants to come back. The people want him to come back because he was a faithful servant of Solomon. But yet Solomon sought to kill him because he was going to be made king. Jeroboam was in a field and a prophet came up to him and said, the kingdom shall be torn away from Solomon and I will give you 10 pieces. And Jeroboam's like, okay. But then as, as, Rehoboam here, as Solomon hears about this, he seeks to kill him. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, has now gone to Shechem to be made king by the people. Now what was interesting is that we looked at this, is that usually a people do not make a king. They do not do the coronation process. Neither in the three kings that we've seen previously have the people made someone king. When we see with Saul that they petitioned the Lord to have a king, King David was selected by the Lord, and Solomon was selected by the Lord. And here we see that Rehoboam is going to go to Shechem so that the people can make him king. And that during this time, again, Jeroboam was in Egypt because Solomon sought to king, uh, kill him, and Jeroboam is now summoned to come back to Israel to come speak to the king on behalf of those who are faithful to Solomon. Because the Bible tells us is that, Solomon, uh, that Rehoboam uh, imposed a heavy yoke on them. Now for you guys who think yoke, it's not an a yoke. It's a burden. It's a heavy yoke that it's referenced to. And what they wanted from Rehoboam, the people, was a lighter load, probably referencing uh, the forced labor and taxation. Many years later, Jesus may have had this very incident in mind when he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30, Come unto me, all ye who are, here, who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What the people sought from Rehoboam was promised by Jesus. His yoke is easy, his burden is light. It's because he is the one who serves. He is gentle and lowly in heart. That's the key. Jesus came to serve. When we look at verse 5, when the people did come, when Jeroboam came representing the people, he goes to the king and says, Hey, look, the burden that you have on us is heavy. Please consider and not making this yoke so heavy. And Rehoboam tells him in verse 5, Depart from me for three days. Come back to me and I'll give you an answer. So Jeroboam says, Good. And everybody, and it says in verse 5, And the people departed. It wasn't a, it wasn't a riot. There wasn't a protest. They were really hoping that the king would provide an answer in favor of lifting these taxes. Rehoboam, it's assumed that Rehoboam probably returned from Shechem to Jerusalem because I want, again, the, the writer is very subtle in how he's dropping hints to us as we read through this. But notice in verse 6, this is the first time that Rehoboam is referenced as King Rehoboam. All the times that he's been referenced before, he was just referenced as Rehoboam, 
the writer again is intentionally given us this title telling us that he has now gone back to Jerusalem because uh, the title that's given to him King Rehoboam may have not been among those who gathered in Shechem but back in Jerusalem and throughout Je uh, Judah he was referenced as king again the writer is setting this up here to show that the sharp division that's going to take place because of Solomon's disobedience. Like his grandfather David, his own people were first to receive him as their king. When you look at 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 4, it says, the men came, Then the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, The men of Jabesh-Gilead were the ones who buried Saul. So we see here in verse 6 and 7 that Rehoboam, in this request that is made by Jeroboam, representing the people and asking, hey, lighten this load up that we have, he now begins to give a response. Have any of you ever received foolish counsel? Just do it, everybody else is. Right? You know, I, I, uh, I'll be transparent with you guys. It's probably a bigger, it's, when I say that, I'm just, it's a fib. <laughs> you know, there was a time when I was, I wasn't on staff here. And there was a time where I felt that I need to be used more in ministry. I need to be, I'm just drying up on the vine, attending. And I kept meeting with Pastor David and giving him ultimatums. Hey, this place is going to hire me. You know, are you sure you don't want to hire me? I was dug, bugging Dave and, and, uh, and there was this ambition to be used. And, uh, and I would seek out counsel from those around me who didn't have my best interest in heart. And they would say, you know what, bro? Yes, you know what? Yeah, you know, you, you're this and you need to be using it. Started like, okay, you know what? Now I'm for sure, okay, I'm going to go in there and say, Pastor, you know, uh, this, this, this company wants to hire me. And he says, I know what you're doing. <laughs> you're giving me an ultimatum. And the answer is no, go where you believe the Lord's going to lead you. So I left and went to a different fellowship. Thinking, okay. I'm going to be used now. And I get there, and I realized it was probably one of the biggest mistakes in my life. Because when you pick up and leave a church and go to another church, you just can't pick up and come right back and say, just kidding. <laughs> because I had made arrangements at this other fellowship to be used and to do certain things. And when I get there, I realize that this pastor is not Pastor David, and this fellowship is that fellowship is not our fellowship. And now I'm thinking, okay, I now need to ride this out. But because I listened to counsel other than the Lord, and other than the counsel that Pastor David was given me, I do believe in hindsight now, 2020, looking back at that, that the Lord used that time to prepare me in where I'm at today, the mistakes I've learned from. The choices I made, I was able to learn. But looking back at that, I was, I, I, I would have sworn up and down, men, that it was from the Lord. Because I sought counsel that was not wise. I sought ungodly counsel. And sometimes we seek counsel and we think, but it's the Lord that's moving. It's God that's opening up this door. And we see what happens with counsel like this. Look what it says in verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he lived and said, How do you advise me to answer these people? Now look at that language that's used there. These people. He's already making a distinction between himself and the people. Because he didn't say, How do we advise our people? He's not taking ownership. How do you advise me with these people here? That's a first clue that the writer gives us that's going to be a sharp division in the kingdom. 
And in verse 7, the elder spoke to them and saying, if you will be a servant. <laughs> I wonder if I would ask you, any of us men here, are you willing to be a servant? Are you willing to do the small things before God may elevate you to the greater things? Because in Matthew chapter 11, as the verse we just took at, it says, I am, Jesus, uh, I am lowly and gentle in heart, a servant. But the, the elders responded and said, look, if you are a servant to these people and serve them and answer them and speak good towards them, then they will be your servants forever. It's interesting that the people here in verse 7 said, the elders said, if you answer them today, if you answer them today, then they will be your servants forever. King Rehoboam took counsel with the elders who had stood before his father Solomon. These elders were obviously older men. They stood before Solomon. They were part of his council. So more than anything, they would have understood the politics that were being questioned by Jeroboam and with those who were with him in Shechem. They would understand because Solomon was considered the wisest king of all. So of course his elders would understand how he would think about things like this. Because they heard the wisdom of King Solomon, they were around the wisdom of King Solomon. So you would think that these elders would impart wisdom into Rehoboam, his son. But the question is asked here is how in verse six. That's an interesting question. Because Rehoboam is not asking about the content of the complaint of the people. He's asking, how do I deal with these people? He's missing the point. His heart's already divided. Because he's not asking, how can we make this levy and this taxes lighter? How do I answer these people is what he's asking. See the division already that's already stirring in his heart? Because he's asking, how does he, you advise me to answer these people? But he asked about the manner of the response rather than what's really being asked. He wasn't addressing what was being asked. He was asking, how do I advise these people? <laughs> you know that there's wisdom and humility, right? Amen. When we look at verse 7, the elders are giving him this clue. There's wisdom and humility. Because it says, if you will be a servant to these people and serve them. Well, isn't that what King Jesus taught us? the righteous king. And the elders' advice to them was serve them. If Rehoboam's response, which we'll see here in a few moments, would say, you know, I would serve them. If Rehoboam's response today, as it says here, will have consequences for the entire rest of the kingdom. How was Rehoboam to act? He is now king. He is now in Jerusalem. And Rehobo Jeroboam comes to him and says, look, you guys have been taxing our people so long. And Rehoboam goes to the, to the elders of the, of the church, of the of King Solomon's people and asks, how do you want me to respond to these people? And the advice of the elders was, why don't you become a servant? But that would, that's kind of strange advice for a king. You're asking a king to be a servant? To serve them? What kind of advice was this? It was, it's the advice that will one day come to full realization when we look at Mark, Mark chapter 10, verses 43 to 45, it says, Jesus Christ who said, whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. 
For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So if Rehoboam would have been like that in the today in verse 7, the people would have served him all the days. There's some something of wisdom in the in Solomon's advice. When you can, if you want to turn back with me real quick to chapter 3, look what it says here that Solomon says that you would think his son would probably maybe get a hint from. When you look at chapter 3 and you look at verse 7, it says, now, o, and this is King Solomon, now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David, but I am a little child and I do not know how to go or come in. And as your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered, therefore give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil, for he was able to judge these great people of yours. This is Rehoboam's dad. When you look again in that same chapter in verse 28, and all Israel heard of the judgments which the king had rendered, and they feared the kingdom, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in, in him to administer justice. Solomon, his heart initially was a heart to serve the people. But we see that Rehoboam now receives his advice from the youngsters. Look what it says in verse 8. But he rejected. He rejected the advice of the elders had given him and consulted with the young man who had grown up with him, who stood before him. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me saying, Lighten the yoke in which your father put upon us. Now, look at the language that's being used here. When we look at verse 7, how do I advise these people? And when you look in verse 8, excuse me, in verse 9, he says, how should we? So right away, Rehoboam is already connected with his young friends. When it says here he rejected the advice, it's his heart in the original language is that his heart turned away from what was being advised. It's the same word that it says when Solomon turned his heart away from the Lord. Same word. Rejected. But Lord, how is your will being done through all of this? How is your purpose and your plan being played out in this whole thing with Rehoboam now consulting with the young friends of his. Rejecting the wisdom of the elders, he showed himself to be an utter fool. So he took counsel from the young men who had grown up with him, and at the end of verse 8 says, and they stood before him. They were raised with him. When you look at chapter 14, verse 21, it tells us that Rehoboam was 41 years old. And these colleagues were of his were called youngsters in relative age to the elders that he first consulted. And they proved to be immature and irresponsible in their words they're about to utter. What's interesting is that the writer points something out here is that when it references the elders, it's those who stood before Solomon. Here, the writer is referencing those who stood before Rehoboam the ones that he turned to to counsel. Isn't it amazing that we will turn to look for counsel for those who agree with us the most? Right? I know I can go to Brother Jeff and, and, and say, you know what, that was a great message. Yeah, brother, that was good. Because he knows he won't say, I mean, he's always been gracious to me. Calvin, on the other hand, would say, hey, that message was just torn out. <laughs> <Is it? laughs> But of course they're going to give him the sound wisdom. Who wouldn't? These are the people that stood before him. These were faithful men to Rehoboam. Of course they're going to have their hand in the interest. 
They had grown up before him and stood before him. They learned from Rehoboam just as the elders had learned from Solomon. But shortly we will see that neither he, Rehoboam, or his friends that he's asking had really grown up at all. Because the advice they give Rehoboam, who would be dumb enough to give that type of advice? <laughs> Rehoboam and his friends. The descriptions in some versions call the elders old men and some in the other versions call them youngsters would show that the youngsters' influence has now influenced the kingdom of Jerusalem. That a new generation has come to influence and power. And perhaps they have never known of anything but extravagant privilege and a heavy sense of their own entitlement. Does this sound familiar? The youngsters, not all youngsters, guys. There are some youngsters that, who stood before the Lord and are faithful. <clears throat> However, there are some youngsters that say, you know what, you're too old. You're still preaching that same old stuff. Things have changed. Things are new. That's not the end thing. And what's interesting is when I do these random moments with Pastor David and and it's amazing how these experts who Pastor David has Bibles older than themselves are chiming in on their expertise. It's interesting. And you get a, a group of those who have that same type of mentality and they're ready to lead a church because they're seeking unwise counsel. And it's in the, oh, you know what? The Lord's opened the door. It has to be the Lord. Yeah, are you sure? And this new generation has come to power and influence in Jerusalem. These are the ones that Rehoboam have now turned to. Look at the question that's asked in verse 9. And he said to them, to his friends, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who has spoken to me saying lighten the yoke which your father put upon us but notice something here remember in and it's interesting again the writer's very subtle in this when you looked at verse uh i'm sorry when you look at verse six when rehoboam is asking the elders he's asking how right because he's not so interested in the content. He just, how do you want me to address these people? But when now when he turns to his friends, he's now asking what? He's no longer asking how. He's now asking what should I do? Now that's, ask, now that's really saying, what is it you guys want me to do? How, and, he's, and instead of asking how should I deal with these people that he asked the advisors, He's now asking his friends, what should I do? That's dangerous. Because when we don't seek the Lord in all decisions that we make, we will ask our friends, what should we do? And yes, friends have our best interest. And they want what's good for us. But sometimes their counsel is foolish. Sometimes they don't see the things that are big picture. And Rehoboam is asking the foolish question is, what should I do? It's different from the how question he asked the elders in verse 6. What he's saying is, write my speech for me. Because he precisely now says, what shall we say? They will do this together. It will be our speech. Rehoboam's report of what the people had asked, he makes no, uh, no reference to what the people are asking. He makes no reference that the yoke has been heavy on them. He makes no reference on the condition of the people. He makes no reference on their well-being. He asks, what should we do? Instead of providing a lighter yoke, he makes it sound like a groundless demand. 
Had Rehoboam listened at all to what the people are saying? You know, what's interesting is when we do have something going on in our minds and, we're, and our mind is made up on certain things, there's really no listening at all, right? Our mind's already made up. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And instead of listening to what the people were really wanting, he consults with his friends and say, how should we answer them? What should we do? Not even caring about the people. That's a dangerous man. A man who doesn't care for the people, but cares about status, cares about recognition, cares about what makes me look good, is a person who is very dangerous because they will never listen to the hearts of people. In 1 Kings chapter 3, we said, Solomon said, Give me a heart of hearing and of understanding of your people. Here, Rehoboam's like, who cares what they want? What do we want to do? That's a dangerous place to be, man. And we can even use that in the name of ministry. Well, the Lord's speaking to me. And, you know, it has to be of the Lord. And we, and we put away wise counsel. We have to be careful with this. And we see their foolish arrogance here when you see that these young men and they tell him what they should say from the middle of verse 10 until at the end of verse 11 is what they're telling Rehoboam, what shall we do? Listen what it says here, foolish counsel. Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him. Again, the writer points something out interesting here. How many people in here, and it would be interesting to see, anybody here grow up with anybody else in here? Yeah. Who'd you grow up with? Calvin Pete, right? Yeah. Anybody else? Isaiah? Marcos? Okay. There's people in here who have grown up with others. There's the advantage right there, right? They got my best interests. They got my back. They know it's good. And sometimes we will use that counsel instead of the counsel that God has given as the elders. And look at the foolish advice these youngsters give. Now remember, they're entitled. They're a little arrogant. Not once, maybe they were there picking up rocks and throwing them in with the sticks, but not once did they put their hand to the plow in making Jerusalem of what it was. They don't care about the people. And now look at the foolish advice that is given. Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him saying, this you should speak to this people. Now, again, there are... There's four things about this that I want to quickly point out, but the number one thing that struck out to me is you should. Have you guys ever gotten advice like that? You know, you should teach a little bit longer. You should, your teaching goes too long. You should. You know, I looked on Google and you should. I've been, in a, I've been teaching a Bible study for three months. You should. And we start putting these demands because of our entitlement that we get when we don't seek counsel from the Lord. And he says, you should speak to this people who has spoken to you saying, and look at their advice. Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. That is a very derogatory saying in the Hebrew. We'll discuss that a little bit more. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. And my father chastised you with whips, and I will chastise you with scourges. Again, some versions say scorpions. We see an arrogance that's displayed here, but a disrespect to the people. You know that when we don't seek godly wisdom and godly counsel, we can have a heart that disrespects. Anyone that comes up to you and uses the word should, 
is usually probably not a good thing to do. But the first thing we see about that is that it was crude. This response was crude. This is really camouflaged in our English language. Because if we're to point that out in the Hebrew and understand the saying of it, my little finger is literally in the Hebrew, my little thing. Which in context is a coarse reference to a male organ. The gutter humor that is used, Rehoboam begins to flout, flaunt his macho strength. <laughs> my little finger is bigger than my dad's whole waist. Disrespect. Second, it was arrogant. The young king who had accomplished nothing. What has Rehoboam accomplished? Nothing. Saying that he is mightier than his father, whose greatness was internationally acclaimed when we looked in chapter 4, the Queen of Sheba, King Hiram. Yet this conceit can almost like, as a reader, it, it almost takes your breath away. It's almost breathtaking because it was very tyrannical. He was a dictator. He learned about the unhappiness of the people and, and, and he begins to put a harder yoke on them. The speech reminds me of Pharaoh-like. You thought my father was harsh? I'll show you what harsh is. The word scourge is at the end of verse 11. Again, some versions say scorpions. We know what scourging is. You think this is going to be difficult? What I'm going to put on you is going to have such a heavy sting on you and it's going to leave scars on you and it's going to leave you left open. It's going to be painful. And we see that the fourth thing that is just straight foolish in what this advice he was giving. When we look at verse 12, he says, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly and rejected the advice that the elders had given them and spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy. <laughs> I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of the events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which was the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebet. So when all the time of consultation and meetings have met, they meet again. Jeroboam comes three days later and Rehoboam has a word for him. And he says, nope. You think the yoke on your father was heavy? This one's going to be worse. And so Jeroboam in verse 12 says, and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day. And as the king said to him, come to me the, the third day. And it was clear that Jeroboam and the people were acting in good faith. They came back as they asked, as Rehoboam said, come back in three days, and they did. They were prepared to work with Rehoboam. But we see on that third day, it didn't go as well as they anticipated because Rehoboam answered them harshly, forsaking the counsel of the elders that he'd given him, and he spoke according to the counsel of the young ones. In verses 13, it says that the king answered them roughly, and rejected the advice from the elders. And in verse 14 it says, and he took the advice of the young men. At least we see the vulgarities and the grossness and the gutter thinking had stopped. But that is all that can be said for Ram Bohm's response to the people because he answered them roughly. In other versions it said that he answered them harshly as they had spoken in verse 4 when it talks about Rehoboam putting a heavy yoke on them. Rehoboam would not use his power to serve 
as the elders advised, but he used his power to oppress. I want to challenge you guys with something here this morning. God has given you a ministry to fulfill, each and every one of us. All of us are called to do something with the Lord. With that, that God has called us to be, are you a servant of God or do you oppress? Are you bringing glory and honor and as Paul says, imitate me as I imitate God? Are we truly a service to others in what God has called us to do? Or are we oppressors or holding lordship over people? Because we see the, the contrast that the writer's given us because Solomon in his day was a servant who said, give me a heart that understands your people. And now not even a generation later, just a generation later, we have a king in result of disobedience. See, men, when we are called to do the work of the Lord and we're walking in disobedience to the Lord, it brings oppression. But as men, when we're called to serve the Lord and we're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, we become servants. I see this a lot. John, I'm call, I feel that I'm called, and I know Dave has had this conversation with people. I feel called to ministry. Okay, well, our cleaning ministry is looking for servants. No, no, no. I'm not talking about cleaning ministry. I, I want to teach on the pulpit. Well, pick up some tables. I'm not really called to do that. And we can have that mentality when God says, if you're faithful in the small things, Faithfulness means that we are servants. But when we think we're too big for our britches, no, I need to go straight to the pulpit. That's where I'm called. Then you haven't sat down and kind of counted the cost. How different from his prayer of his father that said, give me a hearing heart to lead your people. Ray Bohm heard nothing of his people. When in Exodus chapter 7, verse 13, it said, And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed to them, as the Lord said. And when we look at the last part of verse 15, it says, uh, The Lord, that he himself would fulfill his word, which the Lord has spoken by Ahijah, the Shilonite, Jer of, to Jeroboam, son of Nebat. You know, we can look at this, what we looked at, and we can be, wow, this is messed up. This is really bad. This glorious kingdom of Solomon had now come into the hands of an arrogant, disgusting, young thug who thought he had it going on. But what's interesting here is God's still in control. Yes, this turning of events of the kingdom being ripped up and now divided, it, it is because of human failure, disobedience. And whether or not the people's cry was justified, whether or not it was a relevant or a, 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 it was a, a legitimate request that they're asking, we don't know. But we do know this, that Rehoboam's self-serving, insensitive, uncaring belligerence brought the glorious day, days of Solomon to an utter end. And of course we're not surprised by this, right? Because human failure that was disobedience had begun with Solomon. It begun in his old age. That's what chapter 11 verses 1 through 8 tell us. But there was more to it than that. Because it says here, and one version says, for it was the turn of affairs that brought about by the Lord that he may fulfill his word. You know, guys, in the most unrecognizable circumstances or things that don't look good, always know that God's word will be fulfilled. That God's promises are still in action. Yes, we see the foolishness and wickedness uh, that humans 
that it does not hinder the good and wise, righteous purposes of God. God is still in control of things. You know, in Acts chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, when we look at attempts to defy God's ways, God's ways are really used by him to accomplish his purposes, we see here him being delivered by, uh, by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God that you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. What was to happen because of Rehoboam's stupidity was what the Lord would say would happen when he spoke to Solomon in chapter 11. When you look at chapter 11, verses 11 to 17, 11 to 13, and I won't read it, but it says, the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and, not have, kept, and have not kept my covenant, human failure. He said the same thing to Jeroboam in chapter 11 in verse 31. He tells them, Take yourself, he goes, I will tear the kingdom out of Solomon's head and give it to you. But he ultimately warns him and says, if you do not walk in my ways, human failure. But ultimately, history unfolds according to God's word. God's word is sovereign. His plan, anything that we do, any failure that goes on is not, oh my gosh, what happened? I need to have a plan B. No, it's in God's sovereignty. That his will is fulfilled, his word is fulfilled. In 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 31, it says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word, the word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all those who trust him. I want to ask you guys a question. Appointed by God or allowed by God? A lot of times God has appointed us for, to, for us to do a work. A lot of times we will go outside of that and it will be allowed by God. And sometimes we can masquerade it by it's an appointment by God though. It's appointed by the Lord. No, it may not be, but God is just allowing it. And we have to recognize the voice of the Lord when he is telling us that this is an appointment by the power of the Holy Spirit, or we have to recognize that God is just allowing this and eventually it will make itself known. When we look at, if you guys can turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter, well, if you don't, I'll just read it really quick. Deuteronomy chapter 17, and we're going to wrap it up with this. I got one more point to make. Verse, uh, chapter 17, 14 through 20, when, the Lord, when you come to the land which the Lord your God has given you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. From among your brethren, you shall set him as king over you. You, shall, you may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses from himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said, you shall not return that way. And so he goes on to say in verse 18, and it shall be, shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of the law in a book from the one before the priest. Do we see that going on? You see, that's a king appointed by God. Rehoboam is allowed by God to still fulfill his purposes. And men, just because it's popular and just because it looks like it's a good thing and just because you put it in, because, it's in, because the Lord is moving, you can quote it however you want to spin it. It's not always from the Lord. Just because it's popular among the youth just because it's popular among your friends, sometimes it doesn't always mean that it's from the Lord. May we be men that are obedient. May we be men that seek the Lord. And may we, may, may we be men that serve the Lord. Amen? We're going to pick up next week and see the plot thickens, you guys. And so uh, let's pray. And then Andy's here. Uh, if you don't get your ticket today, 10 bucks. 
<clears throat> Afterwards, I'll be selling them to you for 20 bucks. <laughs> Let's pray, you guys. Father, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Lord, thank you for showing us, Lord, the foolishness and, un and, and foolish counsel, Lord. How it affects, Lord, when we don't seek you first. That we have a tendency to seek those around us who, of course, will tell us what we want to hear. Who, of course, will, that's a good thing. But, Lord, may we seek those who, we, may we seek you for wise counsel in all that we do, Lord. And, Lord, I thank you for these men that are here. We ask that you bless the fellowship. You bless the food. Thank you for the brothers that join us online. Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. They're going to be serving the food right now. What's that? Oh, you guys have to figure it out. <laughs>